Bam Margera is a former professional skater, television star, and overall corporate media mogul. At one point in Bam's life, he was even more popular than his direct competitor, Tony Freakin' Hawk, but not so much nowadays. There are many documentaries and videos talking about Bam's life from point A to point B without giving much details. It's usually the typical story of the rock star becoming famous, then a huge drug addict, like on E's True Hollywood Stories. But I feel like that there's a lot more specific details that we can explore about Bam's life that aren't much talked about. Was Bam's life torn into pieces after his childhood best friend Ryan Dunn's death? Or was there always signs that Bam was already on a downfall even before Ryan's passing? What even was the hashtag free Bam movement? Was it in support? To a childhood hero, just like the hashtag Free Britney movement was? Or was it a muddy grubbing grift from a group of people taking advantage of a man's already ruined life slash reputation? And what has been going on with him and his current wife and his complicated relationship with the son Phoenix? I did not mean to match with the background today, but here we are. You like this little fit? This video is more likely a deep dive video of Bam's life, so even if you're a huge fan of him, or was a huge fan, maybe you'll learn something new from this. I really hope so. Oh, and uh, I'm holding this mic too because um, I thought I had a good mic stand, but it turns out that I don't. Turns out the little attachment bit's different than what I have currently on my mic setup. So uh, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's gonna be there. It kind of blends in with my shirt a little bit too. Get ready to be hit with a wave of nostalgia and heartbreak because this is the life of Bam Margera. Brandon Cole Margera was born on September 28, 1979, in Westchester, Pennsylvania, to Phil and April Margera. Phil grew up in Chester, Pennsylvania, which was a really rough part of town, with his brothers, who were all in and out of jail growing up. All of Phil's family dealt with alcoholism, which caused most of them to get into crimes and gain a lot of weight. Phil wasn't much of a drinker, but gained a lot of weight due to him becoming a baker. The family weight situation will become a big point later on in this video, so keep a pin in that. Even though Phil's family were problematic, he still loved and supported them, even when they needed a place to stay or money. April, on the other hand, had the opposite experience growing up. Her family was extremely strict and made her and her siblings do chores all the time. April has stated that she felt like her childhood was taken away from her with having to do excessive amounts of chores. With Phil's chaotic childhood and April's overly strict one, they both decided to not punish their kids very often, along with being super supportive with whatever their kids, Jess and Brandon, wanted to do. Bam actually got his nickname Bam Bam from his grandfather because of his habits of purposely running into walls, something he still does as an adult. According to April, even though Bam was the youngest, he was the boxiest brother. He would often tell Jess what to do and then have a temper tantrum if Bam didn't get his way. If I keep saying something he still does as an adult, well this video will be twice as long. <laughs> Bam as a child was diagnosed with ADHD due to his lack of focus in school. His ADHD has always been bad, even to this day. Bam said if he doesn't get his Adderall prescription, his mind is racing all night, which causes him to be unable to sleep. Bam would meet Ryan Dunn in high school due to Ryan moving to Westchester from Cleveland, Ohio. As most of you know, Ryan would be Bam's best friend to the literal very end. Bam discovered his love for skating by watching a man do an ollie by the school bus. Phil would drive all the neighborhood kids along with Jess and Bam to the local skate park just because Phil wanted to support his children and make sure every kid around them would get an opportunity to try out skating. By the way, I didn't realize before researching this that Phil is just a sweetheart which makes me more angry and frustrated the further this video goes along. Bam was 10 to 12 years old when he would film himself doing skate tricks. Then he realized only half of the 30-something kids he was friends with would be interested in skating. So he was so smart as a child, and again, this was before YouTube, he figured out how to edit down skating parts and mix it in with pranks that he would do with his friends to make the video more entertaining for everyone of all ages. You see, skateboarding is a sport which mostly involves doing tricks. These tricks or stunts, or whatever you choose to call them, are hard to display because it's usually the skater trying over and over and over again trying to nail the trick. 
So to capture and record this, skaters would create demo skating reels to receive notoriety. These demo skates were nicknamed Sponsor Me Tapes. At 13 years old, Bam got his first skating sponsorship from a local skate shop called Fairman's, which is still currently open. Despite having a large amount of friends, Bam was not popular in high school. It would be quite some time before people started taking skating seriously or thinking it was cool. You would be considered just some annoying kid like Bart Simpson if you thought skating was cool. I wonder how those bullies feel nowadays making fun of Bam's niece interest. Bam quit high school his junior year and was later homeschooled by April. Then he got his GED. Another thing skaters were associated with at the time were drugs. Even though Bam was offered drugs and alcohol all the time by his skateboarding friends, he would always decline because he would much rather be skating or editing his films. Bam's love for skateboarding and filmmaking would later lead up to the movie series known as... <music> Jess and Bam both had a deep love for music growing up. Jess, with all encouragement from April, created a band called CKY. CKY stands for Can't Kill Yourself and was based off the cheesy 80s horror known as Sleepaway Camp that Bam and Jess were both fans of. The skating mixed with prank style videos had featured Bam's friends Brian Dunn, Brandon DiCamelio, Ray Yone, Chris Rabb, and Brandon Novak. It was overlaid for music from CKY and other music that Bam thought sounded totally rad. The CKY videos were prototype prank videos that would later become extremely popular on places like YouTube. But since this was the dawn of the internet, people mostly found out about CKY through word of mouth. What Bam and his friends created was revolutionary. The proof of this being the sale of VHS copies. CKY managed to sell over 1 million copies, which wasn't heard of with guerrilla style independent filmmaking back then. Due to Bam's genius advertising for his brother's band, CKY was signed to Def Jam Records. Bam popularized a new genre of home video in 1998, and only a year later would skateboarding change for forever. <laughs> On June 27, 1999, Hawk became the first skateboarder to land a 900, a trick involving the completion of two and a half mid-air revolutions on a skateboard, in which he was successful on his 12th attempt. After completing the trick, Hawk said, this is the best day of my life. But most importantly, that was the most financially lucrative decision he had ever made. Skating was actually becoming cool and mainstream. But due to Tony Hawk's successful 900, more people realize how extremely difficult and technical the sport of skating actually is. And then on August 31st, 1999, Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was released. I really try to avoid on my channel historical zeitgeist because it gets way overused, frankly. But American pop culture changed when Tony Hawk's Pro Skater came out. Pro Skater introduced millennial children to not only skateboarding, but new genres of music as well. The gameplay of building combos and ranking up your skills gave the game huge replayability. Also, more children were getting into skateboarding, which meant more skateboard sales and sponsorships for skaters. This also included skateboarding magazines where you could get all your information on skateboarding? One of the most infamous and naughty skateboarding magazines at the time was from the West Coast, and they were known as Big Brother. There's a documentary called Dumb, the story of Big Brother magazine, if you want the full history of Big Brother. Just like the TKY crew, the guys over at Big Brother would also film themselves doing skateboarding, stunts, and pranks. Johnny Knoxville was one of the writers for Big Brother. He picked up writing for Big Brother because he had gotten his girlfriend at the time pregnant, and he needed a more financially stable job. The name in Knoxville came from the fact that he was from Knoxville, Tennessee. That and Johnny thought a super cool crazy writer who would do super cool crazy stunts be named PJ Clapp sounded really lame. Knoxville decided to download Hunter S. Thompson's personality by acting and dressing just like him and wrote in a similar style. Another gentleman working at Big Brother was Jeff Tremaine, who was the editor. Jeff would suggest, quote unquote, to Knoxville stunts he should do to himself so he could record it for the magazine's VHS tapes. Some of the most famous stunts being pepper spray, a stun gun, a taser, 
and a .38 caliber gun with a bulletproof vest. Other notable members of the magazine were Chris Pontius, Dave England, and Jason Weeman Acuna. Acuna. I'm sorry, man, if I mispronounce your name. I'm kind of bad with names over here. Big Brother features Steve-O as more of a stuntman rather than a skateboarder. Axel and Tremaine would later admit to starring Steve-O to the magazine because he was quote-unquote super annoying and kept asking to be featured on the magazine. Tremaine was convinced that CKY crew, along with the West Coast boys from Big Brother, would work great together in the pilot he, Maxwell, and Spike Jones were working on. Yes, THE Spike Jones. The Oscar-winning director, Spike Jones. Spike Jones started his career off filming a bunch of local skaters editing their videos. That's how he was introduced to the boys from Big Brother and how their crazy idea for a pilot being about pranks and stunts was even being considered for error was mostly because Spike's connections to Hollywood. Spike called up Bam personally to ask him to come on. Finding people's numbers used to be way hotter back then, especially if someone lived literally on the other side of the country. The pilot was first suggested for Saturday Night Live as a reoccurring segment, but was promptly rejected. Then MTV actually won a bidding war between them, Comedy Central, and FX. And that show would later be called Jackass. I'm not going to say the title of the show very often in this video. I'm really, really sorry if that's annoying. I'm going to be calling it JA for now on, on and off. I'm sorry if that's confusing. I'm sorry if that's annoying. <laughs> I really just want to be naughty and say whatever I want, however, how, however I want to. But unfortunately, YouTube's policy doesn't like cussing at all, like even a little bit. So even though it's a biblical term for a freaking donkey, I have to watch out what I'm saying. So I'm really, really sorry if you guys are watching this and you get annoyed with me saying J A concurrently with the show. I, I really do apologize. I have to watch out for myself though. J.A. officially debuted on October 1st, 2000. After the second episode air, MTV gained its highest Sunday ratings in history, drawing 2.4 million viewers among the 12 to 34 year olds, its target demographic. But in a really brief summary, and there's tons of videos going over J.A. series and the history as a whole if you want more specific details. Unfortunately, to their huge list of controversies and pressures from parent organizations blaming J.A. for influencing children on hurting themselves, J.A. was dropped from MTV after the third season. The actual main reason why it was canceled was because MTV kept sending notes on changing stunts from the show and paying the performers a few hundred bucks per stunt. MTV has a pretty well-established history of paying people like garbage. So Knoxville in particular was feeling incredibly artistically stunted. He also had a crazy idea of turning J.A. into a movie. October 25th, 2002, J.A. the movie was released in theaters. The first J.A. movie grossed $79.5 million of a $5 million budget. I actually think the J.A. movies really highlighted Bam and his friends' previous works during the CKY days thus exposing them to an even larger audience. The absolute keto that is the scene with the alligator being in April's kitchen is what would later greenlit be with LaFam. Bam is like a really smart guy and an incredibly hard worker, but he doesn't give enough credit, or April just doesn't get enough credit in general for creating Bam's career with her reactions and just being really, really funny. Unfortunately, these guys do end up traumatizing themselves doing these stunts that they consent to, and giving themselves like a huge wave of anxiety before they perform the stunts. And so a lot of them would drink. And then that's when Bam first started drinking alcohol. By 2002, Bam was already selling out Tony Hawk on skateboard sales. Yes. Bam at one point was more popular than Tony Hawk. Why was this? Well, for one thing was the success of the JA series, but that alone wouldn't reflect in skateboard sales. Another aspect was the fact that Bam was the main skater you could play in Pro Skater 2. But the main reason why Bam was so successful was because of his style. Charisma and attractiveness was appealing to women. Sure, the JA series was full of cute skater boys, but Bam had more of an emo style to him. A lot of people memory hold this, but skaters hated emos and other alternatives. Skaters were already considered outliers and were bullied for skating. But now that it became popular, all these little emo kids liked it too and were totally cramping their style, man. 
Fan became the symbol of emos and skaters, uniting and sharing each other's interest. Fan was also one of the only skaters who had almost the same amount of male fans as girl fans. Fan being the marketing genius he is, knew and embraced it instead of saying, bruh, selling skating merch to girls is gay. His main way of selling to a teen girl audience was producing skateboards that were pink and purple. Not only did Bam himself like those colors and would often wear them, but obviously they were feminine and edgy to appeal to teenagers. Wait, what was so edgy about them? Well, all of Bam's skateboards, even to this day, all rocked this pentagram with a heart design in it, called a heartogram. The heartogram was originally designed by Villa Ballo of the band Him. I have a whole dedicated section to Bam and Ville's relationship, so just don't you worry about that. You can really see the wealth disparity amongst JA boys in one of the most popular episodes of MTV's Cribs. Steve-O has stated multiple times how incredibly jealous he was at Bam at the time. Bam's a good friend of mine, but that doesn't help jealousy. Bam was only 23 years old when he was filming his first TV show, Beaver the Bam. With a humble budget of 300k per episode, adjusted for inflation, that would be almost 500k in today's cash. That just kind of reminds me of like what Mr. Beast is doing nowadays with his own money. I didn't add this in the script of my video, I'm just thinking as I go. Like, really, 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 I want to emphasize Bam was a prototyped this kind of content. Shooting for Viva La Bam is actually where Bam started to get severely out of practice with skating. Before Viva La Bam, Bam would skate for five hours a day. Please keep in mind this is where Bam started drinking and partying more and more. Even though Bam was drinking, he was able to burn off all those extra calories with all the skating. Plus, being young also helps a ton. While recording Viva La Bam, he would skate for an hour if he was lucky. Plus, Bam would insist on skating B-roll, like in CKY or the JA series. Remember what I said before about skateboarding, about how incredibly difficult it was to 1. pull off a trick to begin with, and 2. it's extra hard to pull off and have someone film you all at the same time, let alone in the most flattering way to show off your move to begin with. Well, as they say in Hollywood, time equals money. Not only are you paying people to show up to help out with filming, but you're also paying for the roles of film to begin with. This was before digital film, so everything was physical. And every frame you used to film on costed money. So it went from, hey, let's try the raddest moves over and over again and fill them, to let's try to do easier moves in the least amount of time as possible. Bam was also the music supervisor for Viva La Bam. Just like with the CKY videos, if Bam wanted a specific genre of music to play, their editors would try to incorporate it. Even if it was a niche 80s metal band from Scandinavia, MTV would actually try to pressure Bam to play Nickelback or something like that, but he would politely and professionally say that their music is made for gay wads, and would often reject MTV's music choices, funnily enough. Bam was getting more commercial opportunities outside of the JA multiverse. Bam had made his own movie called Haggard, which features Ryan Dunn as the main character, which is just Ryan Dunn playing himself. By the way, Haggard sucks and no one should watch it. Even though it's his first film with a script that Bam directed, it's still bad. It's like not even the room post ironic bad, just bad and boring. Bam also played himself in the movie Grind. Look, I hate to say this fanboys, but Grind also sucks. Grind tries to be every early 2000s movie trope but fails at it. I've heard a lot of people are nostalgic over the soundtrack. That and the actual skating scenes are the only good things about the movie. Another venture that allowed Bam to flex his cinematography skills was becoming a director for music videos. And one of the bands he directed music videos for the most was him. In May of 2000, while flying to Finland with Ryan Dunn to go to a skating competition, Bam discovered a magazine discussing Vel Valo, the singer of the band Him. Later, he saw a music video on Finnish MTV. He liked every song of the album, which had never happened to Bam at that point. After that, he bought every him piece of merchandise that he could find on eBay. He got banned from eBay because he was too lazy to send the money after he bought it with credit cards. He loved the music so much, he put the songs in the CKY soundtrack. The name of the album was Razorblade Romance. Gee, I wonder what about the album cover that was so appealing to Bam. There was something about Bill Valo in particular that enamored Bam. A lot of the original fans of CKY started to notice Bam dressing from how an average teenager in the 90s would dress up like, to now dressing up feminine and wearing eyeliner. 
Hey, bro, don't you know that's for girls? Van would actually start finding more and more excuses to fly to Finland more often just as a way to meet up with the band. Even though Van was pretty famous in North America at this point, people in Europe didn't really know who he was. So according to the band him, Van had to almost sneak his way to the back of the venue they were playing at. Then Van went straight to the van after the show and excitedly asked him out for drinks. Like a major fanboy with tons of money. Bill said it was like Van fought his way to their circle to become their friend. Friend would be putting it lightly. Obsessed would be the better term for Van's feelings about the band, well, Bill especially. Remember that Haggard movie I talked about before? How no one except for a psychopath like me should watch it for the very specific reasons like making a Bam Margera deep dive? Well, get this right, guys. Bam was so captivated by Bill Vallo, he actually named the character who was based off himself, Bam Margera, Vallo. Bam had also several shirtless posters of Bill hanging from his room like a horny teenage girl. Not only was Bam dressing like Bill, but getting the same tattoos as well. I'm going to acknowledge this next section as it's rude to assume people's sexuality. I'm not going to label any of these guys anything particular because I really truly don't know. Uh, but I looked into it to see if there was anything in particular where they talked about their sexualities just to make extra sure. I tried finding any interviews of Bam or Bill acknowledging any vicarious tendencies just to make sure. The closest thing I could find was Bill admitting in a live journal from 2006 he wishes that he was gay to avoid the predation of female groupies. The concept of a male singer saying that he feels like a sexual object to be used by a predatory woman instead of feeling like a super mega chad is interesting. I feel like this should be talked a lot more in detail tell with today's climate of, hey yeah, men get sexually harassed too, but that's a different topic for another day. Bill was also mentioned later on in the article that hairy balls were not really his thing. Now, freshly shaped twink balls, however. Ben would say how Bill would often get hit by both men and women just walking down the streets of Finland. I mean, can you blame them? Look at this gorgeous androgynous man. So we can guess that Bill has had a lot of sexual encounters with both men and women at one point. But whether he did or didn't really is none of our business. I wouldn't even feel the need to bring up Bam's or Bill's sexuality if I didn't feel like it was important to explain to you guys Bam's feelings towards Bill and how severe they were. Their quote unquote romance felt something more than just like, I like what this guy is doing. I think it's rad and I like hanging out with him. It felt like this deep emotional attachment, maybe even love that Ben felt towards Bill that went beyond just liking his music. There are several photos of them intimately hugging and kissing. Even in re-uploads of those videos together, the fans stated it felt like a romance between them. But unfortunately, when I say Bam tried to be exactly like Bill, this include Bill's drinking habits. In 2005, Bam made his own documentary called Bam vs. Him, a documentary showing the behind the scenes working and directing the Him music videos. Actually, calling it a documentary wouldn't be the right term nowadays. It's actually fascinating because even though it's filmed in 2005, it feels like a modern day vlog. It's Bam walking around with a camera filming himself hanging out with his friends, but he's also talking to the camera like someone's behind it and explaining what he's going to do for the day. Bam really was the prototype of the modern day influencer. It turns pretty dark later on the quote unquote behind the scenes video because you see how often Bill and Bam are drinking throughout the entire filming of the music videos. Bam was not used to drinking that much that time. So you see Bam vomiting and running into walls over and over again, just like how he used to while younger. Sadly, he didn't just do this for entertainment of others. One of the types of alcohol they were drinking from afternoon to the next morning before our shoot was whiskey. Whiskey in particular makes Bam quote unquote violent. Bam has said out of pursuit of fitting in and being noticed by his idol Bill, he developed a drinking habit that was almost as bad as Bill's. Bill used to have an alcohol addiction so bad that he almost overdosed several times. Bill would later get himself treatment and is still sober. Bam, however, never fully pledged to being sober and their friendship ended because of it. In a January 9, 2023 interview, Bill stated the last time he ever saw Bam was in 2017 on a hymn tour in the States and that Bam turned into a monster, the monster being addiction. Are you um, still in touch with Bam Ajara at all? I know he's struggling. No, I haven't heard, heard from him in a while. It's, uh, I think the last time around I saw him was during our last tour in the States with him, which was 2017. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been trying to contact him via uh, Brandon Novak. I'm not sure if you know him, but uh, uh, of the same ilk. So to speak, who was who was a mate as well, but uh, I haven't been able to reach reach out in that sense uh, or really talk to them. I'm, I'm hoping that he feels better because he's a nice guy. He's a sensitive, special fella, and uh, and uh, it's just sad to see that 
is turning into the monster that he is turning into. On August 8, 2006, Vincent Don Vito Margera was arrested without bond. Don Vito was 50 when he was arrested after a skateboarding event at Lakewood Mall. He was accused of two incidents of sexual assault on children. Don Vito was a loudmouth uncle of Bam and a drunk piece of shit brother to Phil Margera. Vito had a habit of being the absolute worst kind of human. A lot of people who watched Vito of Bam would often laugh at Bam and his friends constantly fucking with Vito. Vito responded in literal babbling noises. You would often see April and Don Vito fighting in the series. Well, unlike the pranks. Yeah, sorry to break it to you guys, but all the pranks were faked and everyone knew what was going to be filmed that day. Actually, MTV paid for all the repairs for the homes. The fights between April and Vito were real. April has stated over and over again how much she hated Don Vito. Vito actually ruined Phil and April's wedding and has been a thorn in their side ever since. Remember how I said Phil was an extremely nice guy to the point he was being used by his family members? Well, one of the worst was Don Vito, who was constantly taking advantage of Phil's kindness. I guess that's one of the reasons they felt justified harassing Vito the most on Vivo La Bam. What is for several stunts featured Don Vito, but this was removed from the theatrical and DVD release of the J.A. movie number two. To his arrest and convention of the two stunts of sexual assault on a minor. Now, I introduce you guys to saying I didn't like Bam, the more I realized how ungrateful he was to his nice parents. Both April and Phil are both really nice people. Um, but this next point of this video is what made me actually despise the guy. Spoilers, I really don't like Bam. <laughs> Sorry fanboys, but I wasn't expecting to thoroughly dislike him for this reason. Even though Don Vito was arrested, one of the biggest Vito supporters wasn't Phil or any of his brothers, it was Bam. Bam has stated 10 years after the arrest that Don Vito didn't do nothing. Well, my uncle, there's someone there filming. My uncle like, Don Vito did did a um, thing in Colorado. who was mm -hmm. a signing, and um, his thing was if you're a, a kid, a mm -hmm. guy, choke he, he would oh, fake choke, choke you, you. Right. And then if it was a girl, he'd fake grab your boob. Okay. Well, I guess he tapped the boob of uh, a 15 year old. Oh my and gosh. The fucking. The the chick didn't even care. She was no. like, "Oh, what's the big deal?" But the mom yeah. sued him for everything. They even what? tried. Like, they even tried to sue Element because there was an Element poster in the background. No. It really? had nothing to do with anything. Yeah. Bam, that's not what happened, and you know that. Vito was accused of groping three girls that were 12 and 14, but he was only charged for two. Apparently, the famous Kobe Bryant defense lawyer made the excuse of it just being Don Vito's character from the show. They were just having some heckin' wholesome goofs and gaffs, guys. They were just joking. It was just some wholesome goofs and gaffs. Like, they're just heckin' wholesome, okay? This is reminding me a lot of uh, the weird, creepy editor from Game Rumps that was talked about earlier. <laughs> The prosecution's side lawyer said that Don Vito was so intoxicated he urinated himself in front of these children. Still not convinced Bam knows better? Well, Bam had a radio show on Sirius XM where he and his friends would talk about what was happening in their lives uncensored. And I really want to recommend any fans that are watching this of Bam's to not watch these old podcasts. Like, some of them are funny. A lot of them just really show just how awful and hateful Bam really was towards everyone. Like, friends, family, it didn't matter. One of the reoccurring guests was Don Vito. On January 16, 2006, Bam called Vito a rapist and told women to sue Vito. It's, it's the like, way I always way I talk, but I get pussy every night. That's yeah, what I don't want to hear about that. It is. He does ape. I don't know, but I think we better talk to Amy yeah, really but quick. Yeah, Vito talk does to Amy too. On I'll be the three. first to You know, ask. Vito gets laid a lot, too. No, yeah, yeah, Vito's Vito helps feels. You know what? No, he gets no. women. No, Vito Phil, rapes Phil, chicks. What do you Excuse have to say? me. Vito straight up rapes, dude. We Novak heard gets Phil. pussy. I'll vouch. And so does Vito. Novak gets pussy. Vito does not get pussy. Yes, he does. No, he that just fucking feels and no, he rapes. That just goes to show that anybody... Yo, if, if you girls are out there listening and Vito copped a feel on you, dude, sue his ass. On May 22nd, 2006, Bam accused Vito of committing incest. Lisa has nice message. What? Friday. That's your goddamn she niece. Had, it was good. It was Black Friday. Who was all the bitches? I opened the Hooters up for us at Vito, it's your niece. That's incest. They took pictures of us for the Were you there for uh, the contest? He grabbed his niece's titties. They made pictures like for the star of the night. Vito, oh, don't man. you? Have I'm you ever heard of incest? Oh, you'll see Dina. Dana, whatever her name is. I'm not talking about her. I'm talking about Lisa. It's your, it's your goddamn nice, niece. Well, she gets drunk. 
<laughs> I'm, what a creep. You're not kidding. I've seen you cop fields on her ass. You are a creep. creep. No, I'm not. Vito, you're a true creep. You are. And on July 6, 2006, Bam called Vito out for groping women all the time. Drink your fr Dude, he drinks like 40 Budweiser's every single day. He takes fucking Vicodin with no pussy lined up. He takes... <laughs> Or, or Viagra, I mean. Yeah. Then he takes Vi yeah, he takes Viagra with no pussy lined up, which I do not understand. Yeah. He'll wake up, pop a Viagra. I'm like, why do you want a hard on all day? You have no chicks. He's like, well, maybe you'll get me motivation to get chicks. You know, it's just like, dude, you're just going to yeah. cop feels on random ass girls and then they're not going <laughs> to nod in. Bam, you care to explain why your younger self is more clear with the accusations of Don being a drug abusing pervert? But, you know, your older self, like, you're mid 40 year old self is like oh you know he didn't do nothing like he, don was just joking like he was just he he didn't do anything wrong you guys don't understand i can understand that perspectives can change over the years but to me bam's younger self was showing patterns of consistency while talking about don vito's behavior sure some of the alcohol and drug abuse fried bam's brain cells but i want to make this extremely clear throughout the video if you hadn't picked this up already bam is incredibly smart Bam, even in his drug-fueled 40s, is able to remember specific situations, names of people in streets where he grew up around as young as five years old. He can name every capital of every country. Now please try to explain to me why he wouldn't be able to remember the very serious and specific situation with his own uncle being a child molester. Well, let me tell you why. Bam is a narcissist. His uncle being a convicted child molester makes Bam quote unquote look bad. It shouldn't reflect on you as an individual what your family members do that's wrong, but narcissists don't see it that way. So whenever there is something in Bam's life that he perceives as a negative upon himself, he'll either go on the attack or purposely misremember the situations to make it seem like they weren't that big of a deal in the first place. On November 15, 2015, Don Vito died of kidney and liver failure in jail. In January 2006, Bam got engaged to childhood friend Missy Rothstein, which of course led to the reality TV show Bam's Unholy Union. But before we talk about Missy and Bam's relationship, we need to talk about Jen. Jen Rival was Bam's first serious girlfriend after high school. You probably remember Jen from CKY, the first season of Viva La Bam. Jen was six years older than Bam. They first got together when Bam was 20 and Missy was 26. Jen was super crazy. By late 2005, Bam was ready to break up with Jen, and she was pissed. In 2006, Bam took the stand in Pennsylvania Common Police Court to file a PFA, Protection from Abuse Order, alleging that Jen scaled a 10-foot wall of his mansion and proceeded to break in through the back door. This was the second time she had entered his home after their nasty split without his express permission. Jen would be physically violent towards Bam as well. Bam told the court that she pushed him into an empty swimming pool and threw glass at him instead of helping him up. I believe Bam having an abusive relationship at a really young age made a profound impact on him. He learned how to spot red flags and not stick the pee pee in crazy. When we talk about Bam's behaviors towards his wives, keep in mind if he actually thought they were taking advantage of him, he would have left a long time ago. Because all of Bam's relationship with women usually lasts a very long time, and spoilers, what causes the end is Bam's own doing. Melissa, nicknamed Missy Rothstein, was born on June 3, 1980, in Springfield, Pennsylvania. She attended Westchester East High School, where she supposedly met Bam for the first time. A few months later, after his breakup with Jen, Bam reconnected with Missy. Soon after the start of their relationship, they got engaged. So what better way to celebrate than having a reality TV show? On January 30th, 2007, Bam's Unholy Union, which followed him and Missy in the run-up to their wedding, they managed to plan their wedding in less than three months. Of course, the funding of MTV made it easier. Yes, MTV helped finance their wedding. On February 3rd, 2007, Missy and Bam got married in downtown Philadelphia in front of their 350 friends and family, which ended up looking like an early 2000s gothic wedding. I mean, what else were you expecting? The wedding went on smoothly, and the couple went to Dubai for their honeymoon. A year later, during his appearance on LA Inc., Bam told Kat Von D about the damages incurring on this wedding that totaled about 13000 I had $13,000 worth of damages to pay for. At the wedding? Just because everybody got so wasted, started breaking light fixtures and kicking in the bathroom doors. I was kind of ready for it, though. I'm like, I'm inviting the jackass crew, yeah. and if something doesn't get broken, then that's Something's not right. Wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Something's wrong. 
MTV wanted a spinoff show of Bam's wedding to be about Missy getting pregnant. They wanted Bam to get his wife purely pregnant to film a show. Of course, Bam reasonably said no, and MTV didn't want to work with Bam as much. It makes me wonder how many people out there were conceived purely for other people's entertainment. <laughs> but of course, Bam's drinking habits only worsened after filming the reality TV show. If you listen to Radio Bam, you can hear snippets on how immature and verbally abusive Bam was towards Missy. Bam calls Missy a spoiled brat because she obviously was upset her husband forgot her own birthday. And my girlfriend was such a fucking spoiled brat last night, it pissed me off so bad. <laughs> Missy, you were such a fucking spoiled brat. I forgot, her, I forgot her fucking birthday, I didn't buy her a present, it's been a month now, and, and like she keeps on adding dollars, and you look like such a fucking spoiled brat. I, I, on June 6, 2006, Bam threatens Missy over her calling someone to help Bam over his alcohol bender. I've been on a booze bender for, uh as long as I've been in Los Angeles because I want to go back to Pennsylvania so bad because I've been here for fucking a month and a half and I want to kill myself so in order for me to deal with everything I sip on booze and then I skip to vodka martinis at night and then that's when I black out and then uh, I hit my head at the 101 cafe and then the paramedics came did you hear about that Jesus then I, I was out I was out for 15 minutes and then uh, yeah 15 minutes I was just out snoozing and Missy called the police I mean I mean the ambulance to come over paramedics I wake up in the hotel room to some dude getting ready to put a needle in my arm and I was like whoa fuck you motherfuckers I'm like where's the cameras fuck everybody I, I'm, I thought I was filming like a jackass skit because we We've been filming from like seven in the morning till eight at night wow. every damn day. So I'm just like, fuck you, motherfuckers. I'm like, you're not putting that shit in my arm. Like, we have to test you. You were knocked out for 15 minutes. I'm like, I'm like, kiss my ass, you know. And then Missy's like all crying and shit because I'm like, Missy, why the fuck did you call the paramedics? I'm gonna fucking kill you. This is ridiculous, you oh, know. Man. And then uh, now they think that I'm gonna beat her up when when they <laughs> oh, leave. No. So uh, so they're like, sign this release form so we can work on you. I'm just like. Fuck your ass, I ain't signed a shit. Talk to my lawyer. Then I ran outside and fell asleep in the parking garage near the Lamborghini because Dunn went looking for me. And he was like, Missy, don't even bother looking for him because he's sleeping in a nice place. Yeah, <laughs> even yeah. though it wasn't very nice. Guys, he threatened to kill his wife and it gets played up for yuck yucks. This is what he does. This is his manipulation tactics. He'll tell a story. He'll tell something fucked up, but then it gets downplayed. For yuck yucks. Like, it's not that big of a deal. In July 2009, Bam was taken to the hospital by paramedics and state troopers after Missy called 911 following a four-day alcohol binge. Bam told TMZ, I may get a divorce. Booze helps. Bam claims he was forced into couples counseling twice a week after his four-day bender. Bam also told MTV, Missy thinks I have a split personality. Like Jekyll and Hyde. And he had been taking the antidepressant Lexapro to control his quote-unquote mood swings. Which is one of the first times from what I could see, Bam was opening up about the fact that he had mental issues that would later be diagnosed as bipolar disorder. In December 2009, he entered rehab for the first time, after an intervention from his friends and family, but did not complete the program, leaving the facility only after four days. In October 2010, Bam told Howard Stern that he and Missy were living in separate cities, they meet up once a week, and that Missy knew that he had girlfriends, pretty much confirming the end of their relationship. According to Bam, they're still friends and still had respect for one another, but there's obviously no going back to the relationship they once had. In November 2012, Bam and Missy officially divorced. I want to make it sufficiently clear just how unhappy Bam was before Ryan Dunn's sudden passing. A lot of people in these documentary type videos blame Ryan's death and why Bam turned out the way he did. Yes, Ryan's death did make it harder on Bam to cope with his addictions, but he was already not happy. On March 3rd, 2006, Bam's brother Jess pointed out how Bam was so rich and famous, everything was boring to him now. I have more money than I know what to do with it. I don't even feel like skateboarding anymore, and it pisses me off because I want to skateboard. Cool, so yeah. I should achieve that, huh? But I'm I should, so busy riding wanna... around in fucking Lamborghinis, I don't know Dude, what to you know do what? Yeah. Dude, you're getting to the point where you have so much money that you're not really so happy anymore. I know, I'm not happy. Because everything's kind of boring. I'm not happy. Later on that podcast, Jess mentions how Bam didn't seem happy anymore. 
Bam. Yo, you you're always, pissing me off because you don't Sh seem happy Shipper to me. Shipper Moe's under the influence so much. I don't seem happy because CKY is such jerk No, 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 no. no. Uh, you don't seem fucking happy the anymore. Fuck there, you don't I seem happy to me. I don't like my yeah. busy schedule. So Bam could have anything and everything he wanted, and he still was not happy. Maybe he was boredom. Or maybe the bipolar he hadn't been diagnosed with yet. Or maybe a combination of the two. Either way, all paths led to Bam getting doped up and ending up at a bar. April said that after filming Jay number two, the riot bullet scene where Bam was crying and the snake tortured was traumatizing for him. And the fact that Bam could do some stunts, but he was less of a stuntman and more of a director slash writer. So Bam could mess with his friends, but he couldn't take it. But to be fair, a lot of those stunts would traumatize anyone who would have to perform them. Being constantly under the influence of drugs and alcohol while filming Jay led to Bam feeling schizophrenic. Because, according to him, he wasn't sure if when they were being recorded for stunts or not. On June 2nd, 2006, Bam called to his own show when Phil and April were hosting while Bam was away filming JA2. Bam admitted he pissed his bed from drinking too much. He didn't even realize he did it to himself and it wasn't a JA prank. Ryan Dunn and most of the crew were drinking and partying every night as well. Bam said he felt like he hit a career wall. He was so financially successful that nothing he did mattered. Like a years long build up to a burnout that was inevitably going to happen. He would just party and drink and think that he would capture footage of him and his friends being goofy. Then he'd wake up the next day, hungover with nothing because they were too busy partying instead of filming. What had also been added to Bam's depression was all his rampant weight gain due to all the calories and alcohol. Remember, Bam was not exercising and skating as much as he used to. He would be lucky to find an hour of time to skate. Or he could have found more time to skate if he wasn't literally drinking and partying all the time. So he didn't burn off all those extra calories. In the failed Spike TV's pilot called Bam's World Takeover, you can actually see Bam's weight gain and his negligence towards practicing and skateboarding making him more outwinded and falling frequently. Yeah. A little winded, are you? Yeah. <laughs> and my feet hurt too. Are you gonna be doing this for a while? Yep. All right, I think I'm gonna go spend my time more wisely being drunk. So instead of quitting booze and getting a healthier lifestyle, Bam instead gave himself an eating disorder. Bam has two main fears in life, snakes and getting fat. Bam grew up with a family of fat men and addicts. Bam in an instinctual way knew his future could grow up being like them. Actually, I think one of his main driving forces in becoming rich and famous was to give himself and his family a kind of hope for the future. On episode two of Evil of Bam, Don't Feed Phil, the premise of the episode is what the title suggests. The whole town of Westchester bands together to not feed Phil a whole 24 hours, which is a pretty good episode. Later in that same episode, his mom admits that Bam is afraid he'll end up like Phil. Bam is on Phil all the time about the weight. I mean, there's just not one day he just gives a guy a rest. And you know why he's so crazy about it? A, he's afraid of losing his father because he's a big guy. And the other thing is, he thinks he's going to turn out that way. Boy, how right does she end up being? Bam acts very nasty towards his brother on Radio Bam and he keeps lashing out and insulting Jess's appearance. You men curse and drink beer. You're fucking or 20 ben, pounds overweight and you look like shit. No! <laughs> you look fucking fat. <laughs> well, I'm down. never gonna wear girls' jeans. Well, you shouldn't because you look fucking fat and there's nothing worse than a fat dude wearing girls' no, jeans. No, I like rock bands. They well, wear eye makeup and look America's good. going not gay, Jesse so Mar I'm moving not to Jess Canada. Not Jess Margera's 20 pounds. <laughs> not Jess Margera's 20 pounds overweight. Yeah, Jess, if great. you put on girl jeans, she would look like a fat gay wad. Bam was also financially incentivized to show up to bars and partying with guests. He would get paid up to 20k a night just to drink more. He also owned a bar in Westchester called The Note. The Note would inevitably shut down in 2014. On the morning of June 20th, 2011, Ryan Matthew Dodd and Zach Hartwell both died tragically in a car accident. Ryan was drunk driving at speeds over 100 with Zach riding the passenger side. The car crashed on the side of the road after Ryan lost control. Certainly an emotional time. Best friend and co-star Bam Margera opens up and breaks down after the death of Ryan Dunn. It's good to have you with us tonight. I'm Thomas Drayden. The daredevil, an MTV star who was killed in a crash in Chester County, certainly fresh in the minds of family and friends. The coroner's report is out and says Dunn and his passenger, Zachary Hartwell, died from the impact and resulting fire of the crash in West Goshen Township early yesterday morning. Police have done an accident reconstruction and say Dunn's Porsche 
might have been traveling as fast as 130 miles per hour. 130 when it jumped a guardrail, flew into a ravine, and burst into flames. Toxicology results won't be back for four to six weeks. Our Chris O'Connell spoke with Mark Jarrett tonight. I know the two were very close, Chris. They sure were. Fellow Jackass star Bam Margera was actually in Arizona, Thomas, when he got the call he said shook his world, informing him that his best friend he considers his brother was killed in a fiery crash about a mile here from Westchester in West Goshen Township. Well, tonight, Margera went back to that crash site for the very first time. It was in a very emotional time for him. Right afterwards, he spoke only to us about his friend. <laughs> I've never lost anybody that I care about. <laughs> it's my best friend. <laughs> I was in Arizona when I heard, and I just remember we're, I was with some friends having the best time ever. And at 12:30, I just started punching out the windows of the rental van and ripping out the speakers. And I don't even know why. I wasn't mad at anything or anybody. And. And if it's 12.30 there, that means that it was exactly when he crashed. <laughs> he was the happiest person ever. <laughs> the smartest guy. He had so much talent. <laughs> and he had so many things going for him. <laughs> it's just not right. It's not right. <laughs> How do you get through this? A lot of people have been worried about you. I can't. I can't. <laughs> do you know how horrible it is being on an airplane for six hours, not being with everybody? <laughs> You're just stuck on an airplane. No one had any idea, Robin. It was the worst phone call I've ever got in my life, waking up to that. Margera clearly overwhelmed in that interview. He says everyone in the world knew Dunn as that guy with the crazy antics and stunts in the Jackass movie. Margera says he knew Dunn like no one else in the world, like his brother. He says he will never recover from a loss like this, Thomas. I certainly understand his pain. You think about your own friends, the one that, you know, the ones that you love and, and about losing them. I'm curious, are fans still coming out to the crash site, Chris? Yeah, perhaps even more today than yesterday. Fans are flocking there, putting down flowers. But one thing we saw in particular was this. People coming to the crash site, fans and non-fans, trying to gather, steal anything they could get their hands on, from broken headlights to parts of the engine block. Some people actually told me they're going to put some of this stuff on eBay and sell it. T-shirts and lighters and all kinds of things have already made their way on the eBay. But at the crash site, you should have seen these people pilfering away whatever they could. I talked to a police officer. They said that is illegal. That is still an investigation scene. And these people should not be doing this. But they were taking away everything they could get their hands on. And frankly, it's a, I think it's a disgrace, Thomas. It really is. It's downright low. I mean, come on, people. If you were one of the people stealing Ryan's car parts for memorabilia, rot. There's a documentary MTV made for Ryan telling his story growing up and how loved he was. Even though he never bathed, I'm not kidding, this man, in fact, did not wash his ass. That really showed you how charismatic Ryan was. It didn't matter how smelly his cheesy scented ball sweat was, he was loved. It's a really sweet documentary and I recommend any fans to watch. But the one thing the documentary revealed was everyone around Ryan thought he was going to die from a car crash. When they were teenagers, Ryan was behind the wheel of the car with Bam, Jess, and Chris Rabb in it as well. Ryan drove 110 miles and flipped the car forward eight times. Jess flew out of the car and ended up in the trees. Bam broke the passenger side window with his head. And somehow, Chris Rad was the only one who didn't suffer any major injuries. From that day on, April was terrified of Dunn driving another car again. And, and in Dunn's words, April hated him for it and held some resentment ever since, which he never blamed her for. It was just the worst time in my entire life. And um, to this day, like, I hate talking to April, Bam's mom, about it because she hated me. And to this day, she probably still has a little bit of hate in her for that accident right there, and I don't blame her because it was horrible. Stupid kids do stupid things.
Ryan was an alcoholic on top of being a dangerous driver. On January 19, 2019, Steve admitted on Graham Bensinger's show that before Ryan's death, they were filming a charity special for Guy Fieri. Ryan would have the shakes if he didn't have alcohol in his system. Yeah, he was just an alcoholic, man. And that was like one of the last things he said to me. I remember because we did, uh, the last time I saw Don before he died, we taped this show with Guy Fieri, Minute to Win It. And Don like had the shakes, you know? He, like in the, in the rehearsal and like before uh, we taped the show, like he had to go, you know, have, have a couple drinks. He even said, I'm like, dude, like what the f And he's like, dude, I just, I just got to not shake, you know, like, uh, like I'm, I'm an alcoholic. What I find to be truly sad is Ryan passed on thinking April's always hated him after almost killing everyone in the car accident when they were teenagers. But the truth was, April loved him like her own child. I couldn't get hold of anybody and I ended up calling the police station and they confirmed it, you know, that, um, you know, Ryan was in a bad accident. Uh -huh. you, you didn't believe it, didn't want to believe it? I still don't. <laughs> I still don't, like, he's, he's like one of our, he's, you know, our extra kid. Hey guys, sorry for the somber ending. It wasn't my original intention for this video. I originally wanted this to be way longer, but given how complicated Bam's life gets, you know, after Ryan's passing, um, I thought it'd be better to split it up in the parts and also that it gives you guys videos you can watch in between while you're waiting for different parts to come out instead of waiting for like one gargantuanly long video. I like the Aaron video. I think that Bam's life is more complicated and you know I started this project in January of 2023 and sure enough every single month Bam has pull the stunt you know not in the entertaining way but the way of like man i can get attention from media and you know make my baby mama mad so it's better i think at this point to put it out of parts i'm thinking about three parts and i am so sorry about the weird audio like i mentioned before uh this microphone is brand new and i'm still working out the kinks in it like unfortunately like the fancier the microphone the longer it takes to actually make it sound good you figured it would just you plug it in and it just it's fine but no turns out audio is way more complicated and that's why they pay people a lot of money just to engineer audio because it's that complicated sometimes so i apologize if you like notice like the eaves and flow of the audio going down and up um it'll probably continue like that till the end of the series i really apologize i hope it's not too distracting um but hopefully the next series i do it won't be as bad but I thank you guys so much for watching this one part one of BAM series that I'm working on. And if you guys want to support me, please consider donating to my Patreon. Or you guys, I think membership should be up now. You can donate to the memberships. It's similar to like Patreon or memberships. Um, similar things like you get Discord, a private Discord access. And a lot of my old content has been privated on YouTube because it just doesn't really work for what I'm doing now and I just I think it looks messy and confusing but all that's behind a paywall now if you guys just really want to see it I memberships or you can always leave a super message something um on the bottom um it's just a way to tip it uh, those little super messages really do go a long way for all the content creators you see not just me necessarily um a lot of people get kind of weird about it because I think people are like oh I'm just attention seeking you from like the comment section like no it's just it's just a tip for like anybody you see. If you see like a super message or super comment or something, we all really do appreciate it. Or if you want to watch me live or premieres or whatever, obviously you could do like there. But if you want to help support me just for free, 100% free, uh, what you can do is leave a like, leave a comment, share this video to somebody that you think would care about Bam and want more information or just share it out for the public. Um, YouTube really, really recognizes those shares, and the more you share it out, the more the algorithm is like, hey, this video is doing good, actually. So, um, as these videos come out, I really do appreciate that. So, I'm just going to say all this now, so I don't have to keep repeating myself the next couple times. But yeah, thank you guys so much for watching part one of the BAM series. Make sure you subscribe and hit the bell if you're excited.